Okay. Everybody uh, back there? Great. Uh, thanks for coming this afternoon. Um, it's about time to get started. My name is Nathan Yergler, and uh, I'm here to talk to you about effective Django. Um, I'm a principal engineer at Eventbrite in San Francisco, and um, I've been doing that for a little over a year. I've uh, been using Django uh, since just post magic removal, which was pre 1.0. And um, before Eventbrite, I was CTO at Creative Commons. So, um, so I've been building web, uh, web, web apps using frameworks for a while. And, um, and I think that's what we call talk today. Um, so, and I, uh, I'm going to talk about how to use Django effectively. So what, did anybody here attend the uh, Django bootcamp yesterday? OK, great. Um, so we're not going to do a step-by-step -step walk through how you build something. Um, my goal is to leave you with a set of principles you can apply and uh, a nice flavor for some of the, the deeper parts of the Django framework. So things that you might not see in a basic tutorial, but hopefully when you encounter these problems or you encounter things, you'll be able to think back and say, oh, right, I think there's something there. I need to go look at that. Um, and so there's a lot of material, and it's sort of at a, you know, we're going to skip along the framework quite a bit. Um, since this is a double session, I'm planning to take a break in the middle. If you need to duck out, that's totally fine. If you have questions along the way, um, please, uh, please feel free to raise your hand and ask me at any time. If, uh, if I'm in the middle of something, I might just ask you to defer it for a few minutes until we're at a natural stopping point. So, um, so uh, they say you shouldn't bury the lead. And so I'm going to give you the TLDR version um, in the first slide, which is two points. One is the cohesion rules, and the second is you should look under the hood of Django. So um, what do I mean by cohesion rules? Uh, you may be familiar with this idea in programming and engineering of writing cohesive software. That's software that does one particular thing and, uh, and does it well and doesn't try and mix up what it's doing. And so uh, the principal things we're going to talk about today, my, the things that are my opinion and we talk about them, are going to be designed to help you write cohesive code, and help you write code that really focuses on doing one thing and doing it well. And, um, and it's been my experience that by doing that, you're going to write code that's more testable, more maintainable, and more scalable. Um, and in fact, that's what I mean by effective Django, which is using Django in ways that you can write testable code um, so you can actually write unit and integration tests for it um, and without killing yourself or stumbling over uh, your own feet. Uh, and that's going to lead you to write more maintainable code, so things that you're going to run in the long term. Uh, at Eventbrite, we have code that's been in service since 2004 or 5, and um, some of it's less maintainable than we would like. And uh, you know, so our goal as we write new stuff is to uh, not repeat our past mistakes. And so I hope to tell you about some of those. And finally, if you write code that's maintainable, it's going to be scalable. And that's not just scalable in terms of um, how many uniques you can handle per day or how much traffic you can handle in a single box. Uh, I think about scalability in terms of what's the overhead generally of using the software. And so when we add an engineer to our team, that, that adds overhead, right? And there's overhead for them getting up to speed in our code and coming to understand what we've built so far. Uh, so if you're going to write something that's maintainable, you're going to minimize that overhead as you add people and as your project grows. Um, so, this is, my cohesive, this is what I think of as my cohesive model for using Django. There are three uh, sort of top level things that get a lot of play in Django. There's views, there's forms, and there's models. And the, so when I'm working with a new Django project or existing code, these are what I try and think of as principles for applying things. Uh, a view's only job is to take a HTTP request and turn it into a response. So if your view is actually performing business logic, or your view is doing anything other than the that conversion um, from A to B, then it's probably doing too much. Uh, forms are something we're going to talk about in depth. Uh, and they're a way to take user input and turn it into Python objects. So um, they're, this is a little bit fuzzier, but you know, that, uh, that, that's the principle I try to think about it in. And finally, models are where your data and business logic live. And if you saw Brandon Rhodes' uh, Python Patterns talk earlier today, um, I'm actually rethinking some of this now. But, uh, <laughs> but generally, I think that this is not a bad place to start. So, um, so this is sort of what we're going to talk about um, overall. Uh, there's a little bit of introductory material that's going to be very thin because um, the Django tutorial does a really good job of explaining a lot of the basics and introduction, introductions, but I want to sort of give an overview of some of these things. Uh, we're going to talk about testing right up front, and then again throughout the, the talk, we're going to talk about middleware, um, just because there are some gotchas there. Uh, Class-based views are something new that are very powerful, but very uh, sticky sometimes. Finally, the ORM, the, the database layer, uh, forms, and, uh, and then I will thank you. Um, just so you know, these, you can find these slides if you're interested in looking at them at your leisure uh, at EffectiveDjango.com. Um, it looks like this. You can click the little, little S and see the slide version. Uh, it's all very magical and Python driven. So, um, right. First things first. Um, when we talk about your application environment, your application that you're going to build, uh, it's easy to start a project, right? There's this help for, helper command that creates a bunch of stuff for you and um, just puts a bunch of files on the file system where it thinks it should go. But you know what, what comes next or what comes right before that? Um, here's some things I, I recommend. 
first of all, thinking about deployment from day one. So when you start your project, imagine that you're going to deploy this right away. And assume that you're, you're going to make, let me rephrase that. I know that I make mistakes. Um, when I have to do something manually, even if I have a checklist, I make mistakes. And, um, and those aren't because I'm bad at my job or because I'm negligent. They're simply because uh, I'm human and I have a lot of things going on. And so if I can automate things, my life is going to get measurably better and my boss will get measurably happier. Those are both really great things for me. So um, if I think about deployment from the start, that's going to help out as I start to build out my project. Um, so to do that, you're going to need a dependency management tool. There's a few different ones that I've used that I recommend whole or mostly heartedly. Um, there's PIP with requirements or and, and or virtual env. Um, so if, I assume a lot of people are familiar with virtual env. Um, if you're not, it's a great tool for isolating a Python project from other Python projects on your um, machine. And the defaults these days actually exclude the site packages or the things that are installed at system level, uh, which is really great because then you're more aware of everything you're going to need. Build out, is another, in, build out is the other tool that um, I think has fallen out of favor somewhat. I'm still a big fan. Um, it lets you sort of declaratively uh, configure your uh, project and install applications again into an isolated environment. The, the real key here, though, whichever tool you decide to use, is uh, specifying versions of your dependencies. So it's not enough to simply say I depend on Django. You probably really mean you depend on Django 1.3 or 1.4. Um, and Django moves pretty slow, but other ones move much more quickly. So we've had situations, um, for example, where we did not specify dependencies, and all of a sudden we're, we're, we make a new build for staging, we're trying to test a release for the week, and nothing works. And you start to track down the stack, and what you realize is some dependency of a dependency pull, you know, had a new release, changed the API, and broke things that you were, you, you were counting on. So by specifying versions, you're writing more testable code, and you're writing code that uh, you're going to actually test what you're going to fly. Right? Um, that's, so, and if you're uh, using PyPI, uh, you can uh, specify by version number. If you're pulling from GitHub, which we do a lot with uh, PIP, you can uh, specify the SHA. So that's you know, a real specific version, uh, a point in time of the software. Right, use virtual env. Um, there's this thing called Vagrant. That, uh, has, anybody heard, has anybody here used Vagrant? Or you, yeah, okay, so one person. So Vagrant uh, lets you take a virtual box, virtual machine, and automate a bunch of tasks around it, and including provisioning it and doing things like installing dependencies. It works with Puppet. It's really great if you have an ops team uh, or person. Um, I wholeheartedly recommend isolating things so that it's a little more like what you're going to deploy on. So, so we go to the beginning of your project, right? Uh, Django, yes? Sure. Okay. Um, so the question is, does Django and Python have something like Maven or Rails, I guess, where you're defining um, version numbers with de dependencies with version numbers? Is that right? Right. So, um, so Django does not, um, but that's why you use a tool like pip and requirements.txt. So what requirements.txt lets you do is, um, uh, let, me, I, let me show you a requirement. And the answer is requirements.txt. Yeah. And yeah, let me just uh, let me just quick show you a requirements.tech. Well, let me show you two different things. Um, so I have this slide software I use called Hieroglyph. Uh, okay, thank you. Is that readable? Um, so Hieroglyph uses um, Hieroglyph actually uses build out. So this is I'll show you one of the other. So build out files look like this. They have like any syntax, and you're telling it what you want to do. In particular, interesting here is this develop line, which says do, that this that this particular directory should be developed as a Python egg. Um, the interesting part of that is there's a setup py file, and here. Uh, I have this all requires equals six. So um, I'm actually not following my own recommendation here. So uh, consider this an anti-example, but this, this, this shows you how you can say in a module or a package what your uh, dependencies are. Um, some things don't have, um, uh, don't have setup.pys for whatever reason, for hysterical or historical reasons. Um, so for example, I'm oh wait, I'm going to place. Uh, so, uh, this is, Eventbrite is one of those things. Um, and when this file opens, I will show you. So, this is an example where we use requirements.txt, and part of our vagrant um, provisioner <laughs> actually goes through. <coughs> and you can see um, there's a lot of stuff in here. Um, and they all have this like pound md5 at the end of them, which says what the, uh, uh, what the different. What the different uh, what the, actual, what the actual shots are, what the actual, what, what the hash should be to make sure we download it quickly. And you see the very first one here is Django. And we're Django 1.3.1 right now. So, did that answer your question? Yes. 
Yeah. Yes. Totally. So if you're on Django 1.4 and you just happen to be one of your Django 1.3, there's nothing. When you wrote your test, you right. said, lock me at 1.3. You didn't know that 1.4 didn't break the compatibility. You didn't know that. Right. So the comment, so the comment is um, that if you're going to push your project to PyPI uh, and you use something like that, .py, you're going to lock people into particular versions. And that, is, that, is that an accurate uh, paraphrase? Mean, right. You, yeah, it's possible. Totally. So, um, so my, my comment about that is, I guess I have two comments. One of them is, um, that's totally true for libraries or sort of general purpose things. And in those cases, I would suggest using um, range requirements where you can say, I, I've tested this with Django 1.3 and 1.4 or something like that. Um, but when you're building an actual site for yourself, uh, I would not want to not lock them down very tightly. And that's just because uh, I want to I wanna fly what I, I want to test what I fly and fly what I test. You know, I, I want to actually have that. And so I think there's different considerations for different kinds of projects, and that's a great point. So, that I guess what so we do some sort of same thing. Uh -huh. We have applications, and the applications have general requirements that are locked down. Okay. And then we have a type of package for different sites, and those have locked down versions of the applications that are general. Right. That's a great strategy. So your application for, let's say, um, the lock, Django lock, uh, may require a package. Right. But the site for appy.inc.com has particular versions of the lock software as well as the Django package. Right, right. Yeah. And I think that's a good point, like the DevOps conversation. Like here are the Java conferences, here are the Rails conferences. Right, here are right. The conference. you know, what I use in development is pretty loose with the version number or latest and greatest. But I QA cert put into a production environment, definitely I'll be locked down with yeah. the version number. Yeah. Um, those that, yeah, that's a, definitely a good point. Um, so Django 1.4, as I was moving on here to the kind of scaffolding that Django provides for your projects. Um, Django 1.4 actually made a change to kind of further decouple apps from projects. And in Django parlance, a project is your actual site, and the app are these individual pieces that you build inside of it. Um, there's there are many ways to figure out how to split up your site into apps at all. You might install an app or like Django tagging, as you mentioned, um, which provides kind of basic full autonomy and tagging support for things, um, or just some like, the comments package you can install, that sort of thing. Um, so those would be individual apps that you might add. Um, if you're writing a bunch of code yourself, you may also find it helpful to split up things into apps. It's sort of a, um, a question of style. Um, so, so I'm just going to run through a couple of examples here. And throughout the talk, I've got, I've got some code examples. And um, I use this idea of a contact manager as my example uh, that I'm writing about. So you know, I start a project. It's going to give me. So the thing to note here is that um, I call Django admin, which ships with Django. And I start a project called contact manager, which makes me this whole directory. And uh, in, specifically, it gives me a manage.py and um, then my project directory here. And we're going to talk about each of these bits. Um, we'll actually talk about two, two right now. One of them is settings.py, and that's the project settings. Um, Django has a bunch of dials, and this is a great place for you to add your own dials um, that you want people to, be able to turn, or that you're going to need to turn. So we have things in here for our package at Eventbrite that's things like um, which memcache server should be used, and which, uh, what are the database configurations so that we can hit you know, master database for writes and multiple slaves for reads. Um, and then we have a base version of this, and then our ops team pushes out their, the real configuration for the, ops, for the operational servers. Um, this is in one file they can actually just manipulate all that with. Um, and then the app. So we can now call manage.py inside of our new project to actually start the app. Um, manage.py is actually pretty brain dead. All it does is delegates to Django admin, but it lets Django admin know, um, hey, the rest of these commands I'm going to give you, the context for them is this particular project. Um, so that's pretty handy. When you start an app, you've got um, models, tests, and views put in there by default. Uh, and we're going to talk about all three of those in the, in the next uh, hour or so. So um, this URL file here um, is where your URL routing takes place. Uh, and this should look pretty familiar to most people who have used other web frameworks. Um, but there's a, so basically, uh, we're going to look at this first. So this is a really basic URL configuration. It defines one URL, um, the index for this particular site. Um, you can see, uh, pat there, so this name, URL patterns, is actually uh, important because Django URL comps are modules. They're not object. Yeah, they're modules. So it's the entire module that makes up the URL configuration. Um, and then within the URL here, <coughs> we have um, the actual thing to match, which is a regular expression, and um, what we're going to call when we get that hit. So uh, in this case, it's going to look for contacts, a contacts uh, app and use module inside of that, and then call index. This is Python dotted path. You, you can put the real object here, but um, you don't have to. So, so I think that there's this URL patterns name that's actually important. There are special names you can put in this, in this module to, to, to make Django behave more easily when something goes wrong. So 
something for 403s, for access denied, for 404s, not founds, and for server errors 500s. The, um, the really, so these just all point to views. And the important thing here is that uh, they should be really, really simple because you've already had an error occur or something go not quite right, and um, you don't want another one. And so uh, there's a, we've had cases where somebody tried to think, said, well, you know, our server error page could be a lot more interactive, a lot more helpful to people if we only you know, put, made some calculation to show them something context specific. Uh, except, then that's a great idea, except when uh, the created a context is actually what blew up in the first place. And so now you don't have a context to be specific to, and, um, and nobody can <coughs> see an error. Um, the other thing to note is that URL comps import a lot when they, when they get loaded the first time. So if you're referring to views directly, all those views are gonna get imported, and everything they import is gonna get imported. So um, it can be a non-trivial spin-up time. Um, and the error that can be raised, like if there's an import error because of a bug, you know, three levels down, can be really non-obvious. So if we see something that's pretty mysterious when we're, when we're testing a new feature, um, one of the first things we look at is you know, making sure we can drop into a shell and import our, setting, our, our URL configuration and uh, make sure things are okay. Um, you can also name your URLs. This is a little aside that uh, I find pretty handy where you give a name and then you can reverse it. Um, I see some people on their heads. I think Rails has something like this as well. Um, but this is, this is really handy so that if you actually, your, your, your URL configuration becomes the place where mapping between code and HTTP happens. Uh, and then just finally, we're gonna talk about views. We're gonna talk about views in a few steps, so class-based views in particular, but I wanted to show you just the basic built-in views. Like I said, a view just takes a request and turns it into a response. Um, and you can take other parameters too, but the first one always has to be the request. And so this is the, this is the simplest view you can imagine. Uh, well, yeah, the simplest view you can imagine. Uh, where you have it, give it a name, um, it takes a request object, and all you do is return hello world. So this is not even using a template, not in the database. But this, uh, and you can see that this is, you know, contacts, uh, contacts, views, index, which is the, the path we saw in the URL configuration. Are there any questions at this point? Yeah. Is there a way to sort of static page those errors? Sure. So you could, so there's a, um, so you have a couple different options. Um, uh, typically a static HTML, you can't really serve it just off a file system with Django because there has to be some Python code in there somewhere to load it. Um, but you can serve a template that doesn't actually, that's treated like a static file. And so we'll, I'll show you a little bit later how you handle templates and um, that would be a way you could do just a plain file. That's, um, ours are not quite static files, but they're pretty close. So they have a few conditionals in them about whether we should like the support phone number or not, but it's written in a way that, um, that it, it won't blow up if things aren't there. So, is that answering your question? Uh, otherwise, they're just views, so. Uh, Great. So, um, let's see how I'm doing time here. Yeah, I'm trying, what, what time is the break? Is it, uh, okay, I'll figure it out. Um, so there's two different kinds of test group that you can write for Django, and um, it's kind of, impo it's important in my opinion to keep in mind what the difference is and be aware of what you're actually writing. Um, there's unit tests, which test some unit of functionality, as it implies, and there are integration tests. Um, unit tests are only, Im so here's why I tell new engineers that come to memorize. Um, tests don't rely on external services. They might rely on the database, that's like the one allowance I'll give, but they rely on like a SOAP service or some you know, external third party, and they should be fast. They should be really, really fast, because these are the tests that we want to run every time we're ready to push our code to master, or to, I'm sorry, to GitHub. Um, and it's important that they're fast because if they're slow, people will be like me, and they'll be lazy, and they won't run them, and they'll break the build, and then we'll have to like backtrack you know, 10 steps and figure out what went wrong. Um, and that's a lot harder than figuring it out when you're just having your, your couple commits locally, right? So, um, and they shouldn't rely on external services because if they not, that, that constrains where they can be run and constrains um, what else you need to make them run. And there's two different ways, reasons you can think about this being bad. One of them is uh, that I, don't want to, I want people to be able to run tests anywhere. I want them to test often and test frequently and test, uh, test with abandon. And the other one is that then there's some configuration that has to happen. And now suddenly we've introduced another piece of configuration you have to manage just so you can test your code. Um, so th those are sort of the, the integration tests, I'm sorry, tests are things that test how your code integrates with other services. So now this might actually be something that makes a mock credit card transaction and test that you're processing you know, a declined response correctly from your payment processor or test that you're uh, you know, able to actually uh, communicate correctly with your cash servers. Um, so Django 1.4 adds a bunch of functionality for integration tests and for um, uh, doing sort of behavioral testing with where you actually have a, a more full server up and going. Uh, we're not gonna talk about that a whole lot, but that is there. A, a unit test, I'm, just, I'm gonna show you a really simple unit test here. Um, so Django bundles unit test two um, with it starting with uh, 1.4, I think. Um, unit test two is uh, an improvement to the Python standard library unit test, uh, and that's been included, I think, since 2.7. So if you're running on like 2.6, uh, you, can, you, you can basically always import the Django version 
and you'll you know, be confident that you can use the, the newer uh, features of unit test two. Um, so this is for the pattern. So your test case, um, in this case I've written a, a test for some middleware. And, um, and basically, uh, this is sort of a look ahead, but middleware can, um, is asymmetric. So part of it might run, part of it might not, might not run. So this is a test that basically asserts that if, um, if, I'm not pass well, that's a typo. if I'm not passing in a request object, that my middleware will still operate correctly. So, if that, so this is sort of the extreme case where uh, <laughs> it sure didn't run because, you know, the request site sure didn't run because uh, it's, there's no request there. Um, but I want to make sure that my site will still be served. So um, you can see there's a few things here. We uh, subclass from test case, have a test um, defined. And the name actually, um, most, most test discovery tools rely on the name starting with test something. And then we do some setup, action, and here's where we actually are calling the thing we're going to test, and then we assert, make some assertions that um, something happened or something did not happen. Um, right, so there are many assertions you can, you can use, but this sort of gives you a flavor. And uh, the important thing here is this is a reliable, this, this is a very, very fast test to run because uh, we're creating a few things, but we're not actually um, you know, making any calls or anything. So we created a response, but we're not actually returning it over the wire or anything. Um, when you need to go step up into integration testing a little bit, Django has two different tools I'm just going to touch on. One of them is a test client. Um, the test client acts like a browser, sort of. Um, and the idea here is that it actually is going to spin up your Django application and let you make HTTP requests against it. So it will create requests in memory. It will resolve them against the URL configuration. It will dispatch the request to the view, and it will give you back the response. So in this case, um, you know, we make client. We do a get request for slash login. And we're asserting that the, the status code is 200, so that the, the, the login page is actually resolvable and working at this URL. Um, and then you can, you can also do post this way, passing in your um, uh, post data as a dictionary. Um, the test client is slow. It's uh, very, very slow. Um, and its slowness grows over time uh, as you add more code to your project. So um, we, have gotten, we, we have been able to achieve uh, you know, tens or hundreds of milliseconds shave off of test time by converting it from test client to something that doesn't use test client. Test client is fantastic. <laughs> and if you have you know, 2,000 tests, that's, that's actually interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the question is, are we using continuous integration? Yes, we. Uh, I mean, it's sort of tangential. We um, we have Jenkins or Hudson, whatever, whatever the the morally correct version of Jenkins or Jenkins Hudson is uh, running. And um, sorry if I'm for Oracle. Um, and uh, it, you know, whenever stuff gets committed to master, it does a build, and there's many steps involved in that. But yes. Are we using Selenium instead of this? So, um, no. Well, not instead of this. We are using Selenium, um, and that's something that. Um, I'm not really going to talk about a whole lot, but I can tell you that our approach to this is that uh, there's the unit tests are things that run really fast and things that we want people to run every time. Then there's a set of smoke tests that are kind of similar to this that we want to run, um, maybe not right before you commit, but you know, every time we do a build to make sure that really poor pages still work. And then there's a full automation suite, which is Selenium um, and WebDriver, and it fires up a whole instance, um, a whole database, builds that all out. And so our Hindu's innovation server does these in steps. So if the, if, the, if the unit tests fail, we don't even bother with Selenium tests because we know we already have a, we have a problem already. So. Um, Django 1.3 introduced this thing called the request factory, which is actually pretty interesting because um, it shaves off some of the slower parts of test client and lets you write tests for your views. So um, it does not do URL resolution. Um, it does not do lookups. What it does is it just makes request objects. Uh, it has the cunning name request factory. And um, then you can pass them to views. It's important to note that middleware is not run on these. So if you have a user dependent on middleware, you can't use this. Um, and basically the API looks exactly like the test client. So you make a request factory and then you make, you call dot get, you call dot. Um, post, but the difference is instead of getting a response back, you get a request back, which then you just pass into your view object or into your view. Um, Django run, has a manage.py command run tests. A gotcha is if you don't models, you will not get tests. So you have to have a models.py even if you don't want one. Um, and you can replace this. Their, their test runner is um, totally adequate. Um, we use Nose um, for our test discovery, not because it's fantastic, but because it does coverage reporting for us. So we can see what our test coverage looks like. But that's, um, there's a dial you tweak for that. And I'm happy to show somebody that later if they're interested. So um, I want to jump over to middleware at the next topic. Um, okay. Are there any questions about sort of the overview of testing before we move on? Great. Um, so I think middleware is something that um, a lot of people sort of use but don't really think about. And I want to talk about it in, talk about it in particular because um, it's, it's really useful. We use it a lot. And it can be the source of some really spectacularly subtle bugs. Um, so I want to point out some of those things as we talk about it. Basically, middleware is a way that you can grab things that come in or leave your site and um, take some action on them. So uh, there's a few different hooks we'll talk about, but basically it's a sequence of classes that you define in your settings. And the, and the, the basic one, the one that's included with Django out of the box, is these five pieces of middleware. So you have the common middleware, which is a little bit of setup. 
session middleware, which will look up your HTTP session for you, or store it back to a cookie when you leave the request leaves. Um, cross site request forgery protection, um, authentication, make sure the user is uh, in the where you put it to be, and then excuse me, messaging lets you pass little messages to the users. Um, so but you can add, you can you know change the order, manipulate them, whatever. Um, and then there's like five hooks here that, that you can hook on. You can you, you can trap things when the request comes in, when the response goes back, when the view is about, about to be called. Um, and then you can also trap exceptions and template responses. So this is a, another way when you do error handling that you can, um, you can take a particular action or take maybe just do logging uh, when there's certain errors. And individual pieces of middleware, almost none of them implement everything. You, you know, these are just the hooks that are available. You implement what you want. So we talked about some typical uses. Um, but here's, here's an example sort of that I was writing the test for before, where um, th this is a simplification of what we use for our internationalization of the product, where we know users have a locale, we know we want to be able to translate content into the locale, and so we need to make that available to everywhere on the site. So we have middleware that comes in and basically says, hey, does they, do they have a locale cookie? Um, if they do, then assign that to the request. So we basically shove that on the request, and, um, and if they don't, we set it to none, and then we know that later we can, um, we can offer them the opportunity to choose one of our many marvelous international experiences. Um, on the other hand, when, when the response is going out, the process response here, we look and see, does the request have uh, a locale? And if it does, we set, we set it into a cookie. So you can see how this sort of completes the round trip. The, um, the thing to note here is that um, here we do a get adder as opposed to just request.locale. And that's because we're not guaranteed that the request side is going to run. So we've implemented both of them, but we're not, gonna, we're not guaranteed they'll both be run. Um, that's a really important point. Um, on ingress, or when a request comes in, middleware is executed in order. But if any of this middleware returns um, a response, the rest of it is not executed. So you could use this for like, an authorization check to make sure somebody's authorized to access your site, or, um, uh, or maybe a maintenance middleware that you use to short circuit all requests when you put your site in maintenance mode. But basically, if, if this first um, method here returned response object, none of the subsequent middleware would get executed. But here's, the tr here's the sort of the gotcha, which is that um, when on egress, so when it's going back out, all, the, all of the middleware is executed in reverse order, executed even if the corresponding bit was not executed. Um, so, you know, you look at it and you think, oh, there's symmetry, but there's, there's implied symmetry, but it's not symmetry. Um, you know, there's simple, so, I, I don't know if you're writing your own, but there's like two things here to point out about middleware when you're writing it. One of them is, it's long lived. So, when your site comes up or when your process starts up, the middleware is instantiated, and that's the middleware object that's gonna service every request uh, until your, until your process dies. So, uh, you know, we use Nginx at the front end, uh, start up several, um, two dozen workers per, um, per Nginx instance. And so, when each of those two dozen workers comes up, they create middleware objects in memory, and those are held, held on until Nginx um, execute, until, until it kills off the worker. Um, we had a bug one time where, uh, where I would visit, like, the French version of the site, and then uh, Ben here would visit the English version of the site, and he would see, um, he would see French content, and you can understand why that was distressing to us. Um, <laughs> And what it turned out was, over here, and we had this locale middleware, and instead of saying request.locale, we said self.locale. And you can easily imagine how, if things are not quite executed in symmetry, that my self.locale self is still lingering now when, when Ben comes and visits the site. Um, so we're going to request um, specific information, and it's cunningly called the request. Uh, so if you're writing middleware, writing things, generally they're going to be request specific or user specific. You write much request and not on something that's longer lived cross requests. Um, does, that, does that make sense? Yeah. Sure. Sure. So that, that, that's another common use of middleware is to sort of do that so that you can do it once, and then um, we've got some place on the site where we serve a, a sort of different template or we direct a different view, or and we so we do, detect, we do the classification once, and then we can use it. Um, the downside is if you're not if you have a big site like we do and you're not doing it, and you're not providing the mobile experience in a lot of places, then there's possibly you're, you're, you're introducing overhead for a lot of people who don't need it. So um, yeah. Uh, Right, that, that's just a great, great point, is that um, uh, middleware is one for every request. So be thoughtful about what you put in there. So finally, I just want to comment, there's a thing called WSGI middleware. Um, uh, WSGI specification defines middleware. It's similar, it's not the same, it's confusing. Uh, so be aware. <laughs> uh, they're, they're, they're different. Um, so the next thing is class-based views, and I'm kind of thinking, um, we're close to break, right? 10 minutes. Uh, let's start. What's that? Well, uh, yeah, let's just start with this and see where we get. So, um, so there, yeah, there's three big chunks left here. And, uh, yeah. So Django 1.3 introduced this thing called class-based views. Class-based views 
um, are exactly what they sound like. They are views that are based on classes. Um, but more importantly, they allow you to compose a view from different pieces. So you can uh, sort of make your particular class focus on what makes that view special and incorporate like authentication from somewhere place else. There's lots of power here, and there's also a whole lot of complexity. So um, this is my first attempt at sort of providing a treatment of classically fused, um, and we'll see how it goes. So um, the most basic class-based view is a use subclass view, and um, you implement a method that matches an HTTP method name. So in this case, this is sort of um, an idea that you have a contact list view for our contact manager, and uh, you can see we've subclassed the view class, and uh, we've defined a get uh, method on this class. So now if somebody posts, there's an HTTP post, HTTP head, or some, some other method, they're going to get a method not allowed. Um, so we've been really explicit that this is the only method that we're, uh, that we're going to support. Uh, using temp so, so that's sort of basic, but you almost never wind up implementing these directly when you start subclass things. So um, here's an example of a template view, which provides a lot more scaffolding. It provides support for loading a series of template names off of, uh, you know, in order from the file system that finds them, and then giving us some context data. So in this case here, we've said, hey, this is just the index.html template, and um, here's some context data that you're going to need in order to render this template. Uh, yes? No, this is not inheriting from my place. Um, uh, <laughs> thank you. So, so um, right. Working on GitHub. And <laughs> um, no, so this should be implemented. From, this should be some classing template view, actually. Um, but this is one of the really common idioms where you have get context data, and you're, but you're just providing the things that are um, specific for your contact li list. So your template might also need things like the current user or the request or something um, to be rendered. That's how it's go for this. You, you're just doing what's needed for, the, um, for, for this particular view. And we're, we're going to talk about why this is important in a second. So if you remember, the URL conf expects that you're going to give it a call, right? It expects you're going to give it something that can be called with a request and get back a response. So one of the sort of things that feels a little kludgy about view, class-based views is, um, is that they, you have to call this as view method on them. So um, as view gives you back a callable that will then dispatch things. So, this is, so there's a little bit different invocation in the URL configuration. And um, that as view ends up putting much stuff onto the class for you. So there's a lot of mixed things. It can be confusing. Um, but there are a few idioms that we're going to talk about. And so, um, you know, usually, so I hope that you know, we'll talk about this and you'll kind of have a sense about where to start looking when you want to do class-based views. Because they're actually pretty, um, they're very useful. We found them very useful, but very, you know, they are confusing. So um, we just talked about the template view class. And so there's um, four bits here that I want to talk about. Um, Get con so we, we show the contact data and the template name, and then there's this response class property. And um, this lets you actually say, you know, I'm going to return a JSON response, or I'm going to return something other than just HTML. Um, by default, it's just going to be a regular HTTP response class in Django, which says, just, you know, give, <coughs> um, sorry. So there's a rendered response method, which is pretty idiomatic for these things that actually have um, some template or some construction going on. And the default implementation instantiates your response class and returns it. So, um, so, th so, that, so that lets you do some customization, like, you know, do a JSON response, do something else. Um, we have, we're going to talk about this more a little bit later, but for forms, there's also this process form view. Which, um, if you go to Django forms, there's, a lot of, there's some boilerplate involved in how they recommend you construct the workflow. Um, so this eliminates all of that. This is one of the biggest wins, in my opinion, of, of class based views, is that uh, it lets you really strip away a bunch of that boilerplate for forms. Um, but yeah, you have a success URL that you're going to go to if your form is successful. You've got a form valid action that's going to get taken and an invalid action. That's it. That's all you have to define. And finally, there's also a, a subclass of that for editing. And you can actually automate things like, or um, simplify things like object creation and updating um, using these editing views. And uh, yeah, so basically there's a get object that returns after you can actually work on, and there's a model that you can define. It will automatically do that, and we'll talk about that some more too in the forms section. So um, I mentioned earlier that you name things based on HTTP methods. By default, this is what it supports in Django 1.4. So it's pretty thorough, but you know, if you want to say you support HTTP patch for some reason, you know, you've built some API that uh, uh, does patch, um, which would be pretty cool. You're going to need to edit method names on your class. Um, anything, anything that's not in this list will get um, a method not allowed. So I talked about, I mentioned that super call and that we saw in that earlier example. That's super, that's, the super call is super important um, because it lets you mix things with others. So here's an example. We, this is a gross simplification of something we use at Eventbrite where we have lots of pages that <coughs> perhaps unsurprisingly um, have events on them. And a lot of them are just a, 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 one of many pages for a particular event. And so this is a class-based mix view mixing we made that lets us provide that event into the template context so it's always available. So this is a way we can abstract out part of this, this work that we were repeating in lots of places. So um, there's two things to note here. Um, first of all, we have this get event method that's specific to this view or to this mixin. 
Um, and it delegates to some other thing that you know you import somewhere else. Um, that I'm, not, I'm sort of trying to wave my hands and simplify this uh, sufficiently. But you know, you can see it caches it, so it only does it once, and then it, and then it returns it. And then you have self, you have get context data, um, which is one of those idioms we talked about. Uh, it calls super, and uh, and then returns a the context. And this means that when you're composing event page mix in with something else that also has the context data, you're not gonna, you're not gonna step on their toes. So if you didn't call super, you would lose you know, things further up the chain. This lets you sort of continue to add things as you walk down until you get to your base or to your you know, concrete view. Does that make sense? Yeah. Object. Yes, um, the idea, here, so uh, keep in mind that super, um, super is a little bit funnily named in Python. It's not call it on the super class, it's look up this method in the method resolution order and give me the next one. So the idea is that this mixing will always be used with something that subclasses from view, right? And view implements get context data without a super. So that's sort of the end of the line. So this is actually. <laughs> so that's right. It's, it, yeah, so if you, um, I don't know if I have, I don't have markers. Um, yeah, if you just imagine that object sort of falls out of this because. Uh, it, it's using the method resolution order, and um, yes, uh, is that actually, oh, okay, yeah. Um, so I don't know if people can see this, but so if you have um, view, and then you have your, um, and you have object, and you have your mix in, and then you have something that inherits from both of them, right? So you have some mix in you've defined. Um, you have some view that inherits from view and your mix in, right? Um, when this call, when super gets called here, it actually doesn't go up. It's called in the context of a my view instance. So that first argument you pass into super, or the second argument, I'm sorry. This is sort of a digression, but this is where, I, where I'm at now. And what is the actual instance I'm working on? That instance is a my view instance. It's not a mix in instance. So, when you're up here and you say, hey, what's the next one? It's like, oh, it's not one up here. Um, it's going to be over here. And this is very, I mean, there's a dependency about what order you find things in. But in general, um, view should always be last in your inheritance tree. Um, super is more, you know, it handles things like this, A, B, C. It also handles, it also handles diamond shape inheritance. And it does it correctly and deterministically. So some people don't like super. Some people think it's evil and uh, too confusing. Um, I think super is super. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, thank you. So, um, so we kind of have to do that, but I think it's about break time at this point. So but I'm going to go ahead and take, um, take uh, five or ten minutes and come back, and we're going to move on to the database layer and forms, um, both of which I hope will be informative. Thanks. Two big things we didn't talk about yet. Um, one of them is the ORM and one of them is forms. Um, so let's get, let's get started. <laughs> so, um, so when you write, so the, the ORM is the object relational mapper, and it's what takes rows in your relational database and turns them into objects, hence the um, plumber name. Um, you write models with this declarative syntax, uh, which is sort of interesting because um, you're going to find two classes here. These are going to correspond to tables. I haven't given any names for the tables, so it's going to infer them for me um, from, the, from the application and the model name here. Um, you can see that the slide is replete with typos, um, and, uh, and these different fields take different some different parameters, so like character fields have a maximum length, whether they can be blank or not. Date fields uh, let me you know, set them to now automatically if I don't specify a value. There's things like email fields, which are really just character fields with additional validation, that sort of thing. The um, one thing to note here is I have a foreign key. Um, so this says that you know, the address is actually going to be an address ID column, and it's going to point to an address model. Um, and when I look at the address property of a contact, I'll get back an address model if it exists, not, not the ID. So um, under the hood, Django will take these declarations and uh, process them and actually put them into um, instance-specific lists, which, can, which basically means there's some things you end up doing that you think you're operating on a class property, but you're really operating on instance property. And that's because both models and forms use metaclasses extensively to control construction. So you know, it's pretty, this list should look a lot like working with regular Python objects. If I'm going to make a Nathan contact, um, I instantiate contact, I set the properties, and I call save. No, no, uh, no, no big deal there. But, but so in the model, so this is what I'm rethinking now, but I'm going to say it anyway. 
Um, models should encapsulate your business logic. They should define how your data is stored and what operations you take on. Um, and this, does this will encourage testable code. So this means, I'll show you an example in a moment, but basically, um, if it's going to operate on a model or on a contact, defining it as a method of the contact model is a whole lot better than doing the operation man, you know, kind of as a one-off inside of you somewhere. If it operates on a set of um, your models, so say I want to operate on multiple contacts, then that's going to go with something called the manager. So, um, yeah, so this is kind of out of order, I guess, but save, saves the entire model. And I just want to call this out because this is a, another place you can kind of get into trouble uh, if, you're not, if you're not aware of this. Basically, if, uh, if I load an instance of the Nathan contact and somebody else comes along and loads it and makes some changes, and then I save mine, their changes are gone even if I didn't change the same fields. So Django, when you call save, it's doing an update, and the update includes all the fields in, in the model. There's something called Django dirty fields, which is a, a mix in you can use, and it keeps track of what's been changed. Um, it doesn't change the save behavior by itself, but it does let you keep track of this so you can do things like, um, you know, own, you, you could conceivably overwrite save and, uh, and leverage that information to execute a very targeted update. Um, so I mentioned this thing called managers. Um, Every model has a, has a manager, and by default, it's the dot objects uh, manager. And this lets you operate over the entire collection. This is how you also start querying your data. So um, here's some examples where I say objects.filter, the last name is Yurgler. And uh, here's another example where I say, or I'm saying the address state is Ohio. So two things here. Um, first of all, th there's, th there's a, the filter here is actually sort of delegating to a query set. And the double underscore has um, semantic meaning in, in, um, in the ORM. So it can tap. But unfortunately, it has two semantic meanings. Um, the first example here is where we're using it to define what sort of test we want to apply. So I exact uh, it is short for case insensitive exact. So this basically says if, there's anybody, if you know, I, want get, I want to get all of the contact objects whose last name is Yurgler, regardless of how it's capitalized. Um, the other way is this address underscore state here, excuse me, um, where it's actually said we're traversing uh, a foreign key. So this says, hey, join us to the address table, and then show me uh, contacts where the state column on address in Ohio. So we're actually making that. And you can make that. Yeah, you can. You can do multi-step traversal. That doesn't mean you necessarily should, but you can. And you can use them together. So I could say address double under state, double under um, I exact is equal to lowercase oh, for example. Um, or there's like set operators too. So the Django queries documentation is actually quite good in terms of going through all these options. I'm going to call out that these looks like they're similar operations and they're not. But um, so managers are the place you put stuff that operates over sets of your data. Um, and you can override the custom manager if you're going to do this. So here's an example of uh, maybe a common operation for my contact manager is that I want to get out a list of all my contacts that have email addresses. Because I'm going to complete email, and I have contacts with a phone number. Um, I don't want to see those in my list. So I can find this with email method here on the manager, and it's going to return all of the contacts where email is not empty. So any is not equal. Uh, and then down here in my actual model, I say objects is equal to a new contact manager. So uh, two things I want to point out. One is that the manager is shared across all instances of your model. So uh, we were changing it once here in the class declaration. Uh, and, um, and second, this lets you, OK, yeah. So and second, um, you know, self.filter, you're already operating on the manager. So you, don't, you wouldn't call contact.objects here. It's just you're already there. Um, there have been times we actually needed to really heavily customize managers. I want to just point out how you do this. Um, so at Eventbrite, we started the site before Django even existed. And so there's still a large chunk of the code that is not Django if I would And um, there's data in the database that has different, slightly different semantics than, than Django, right? So Django has certain semantics for when you don't have it. Basically, Django stores a null value when, um, when your foreign key doesn't point to anything. Our old code stores zero for historical and hysterical reasons. Um, but we need, our, uh, we need our manager to actually operate with this. So we have a customized manager we use everywhere that knows how to handle this. And one of the things we did was override get query set. This is like the lowest level not the lowest. It's one of the lowest level bits of manager API. And basically, everything else changed off of this. So when you call objects.filter, objects.update, objects.whatever, all of them call get queries at first. Um, and so let's talk about testing models. Uh, you want to test your business logic that you write, and you want to test your customized manager methods. I think that, I mean, basically, you don't, what, I, what I'm saying here is you don't need to test that it actually saves. You don't need to test that loading works. Um, Django has pretty darn good test coverage. That's not code you wrote, and I'd be hard pressed to fix it if I, I mean, I think it's more likely that I find a bug in my test than I would find a bug in their stuff, probably. Um, and you're not, it's not something you're necessarily going to fix anyway. So test, focus on what you're writing, what you're responsible for. Um, here's an example of a test for an objects thing, where I, for a manager method, where I'm, um, I'm making two different, uh, I'm basically testing my with email method, man, confirming that it really returns what I expected to return out of the database. Um, this is a slight, slight violation of my don't interact with external services suggestion. Um, you know, 
um, Django luckily handles a bunch of this for you. So when you write a test, it actually creates an entire copy of your database schema for you on the fly. At, at when it starts the test, all your tests operate in that test database, and when they finish, it tears it down. So uh, you can do this pretty easily. Um, and so you, so uh, the assert equal, I think, makes sense um, based on our previous slides about tests. But here, there's, you're seeing another manager method, create. And create uh, is basically a shortcut for uh, insert, a SQL insert statement. So instead of doing, um, you know, create an object in memory and then set some properties and then save it. Here you can do it in one shot, creating an object. Um, so, what if we don't want to involve the database when we're doing these tests? What if we want to, whatever testing our business logic, and uh, we really want to, you know, we we want to make these as fast as possible and really focus on what we're our, on the logic? There's a package called Factory Boy that we've used that I really like um, that lets you do this. So here's an example. What you do is you make a factory, and then you use this factory to make objects. Sounds pretty straightforward. Um, this, and it ha basically, it knows how Django models work. So here's a contact factory. You tell it what it's a factory for. So it's a factory for my contact model. You give it some defaults, in this case, John Doe. And now I've got an object I can use um, to start making objects. So if I call uh, contact factory.build, I'm going to get an object in memory that's not saved to the database. Um, so this just does the initial instantiation part and sets the fields. It doesn't actually save it. Um, so just doing .build is going to use all the defaults I have. So first, it's going to be John Doe. Um, you know, I can override one of them by passing it, passing it as a keyword argument. And then if I actually do need to write it to the database, I can call .create. So you can see this lets you, um, if I do the nice uh, shortcut, which writing a lot of unit tests, um, you can actually create the, the fixtures around your tests much more quickly. And it also handles subfactors for foreign keys. This is actually where it really shines, in my opinion, because uh, when you're writing tests that are kind of traverse, when you have a test that's going to traverse multiple relationships, it can be a real pain to uh, create all those objects and get them put together. So here I made a, an address factory, and uh, I've got, I might have this one in the wrong direction, actually. Um, anyway, you can kind of see that you have this idea of a subfactory, right? So, and then you can actually do the traversal, um, where, you, where uh, it's actually called the, sub, called the other factory at the same time um, to, to instantiate both objects. We showed a little bit about querying here. Um, Queries are, are chainable. This is pretty, I'll, I'll tell you why not, why you shouldn't do this in a moment, but, this is, but it actually is pretty powerful. So you can pass around a query set, you can call other methods on it to get a new query set, um, and they're not actually evaluated until you try to access the data. So at this point, if I would execute this command, there's no database access involved. It's not until I actually ask it for the first record, or you know, say, you know, swear back and zero to it, dereference it, that it's gonna um, have it. And these are and, SQL ands, so all the conditions have to be true. There is this thing called a queue object, where you can do ORs. And you see they look, they look pretty similar to, uh, to the previous example here where I'm saying either the state is Ohio or the email ends with osu.edu. Um, you, you, can you can actually pass those in for ands as well um, if you want to do some everywhere for consistency. You don't have to. Um, so let's talk about some performance things. Instantiation is really expensive. Um, the Django ORM can only instantiate about 40,000 uh, objects per second uh, at best case. Um, and I hope that you all have the delight of working with sites that have more than 40,000 bows in the return set. Um, so, they are, so these queries are lazy, they're not evaluated until you try to access them, but then they're evaluated and that's, that can be expensive. And so here's an example where um, if I'm sending an email, uh, I'm getting, I'm saying you know, for user and users, the object filter is active. So basically give me all my active users and then send an email using the user email address, right? But this is, this will take a long time with a lot of users. So there's things called, there's two things, one's values and one's called values list. And it's basically that you do the query and avoid instantiation. So here's the exact same thing rewritten so that I don't instantiate those user objects. So what I do is I um, do my filter, like I did before, and then I say values list. And now I can give it any number of arguments and say, these are the only values I care about. Um, the flat equals true says, just give them to me in one big list of emails. So uh, we've seen you know, multiple order of magnitude uh, performance increases by avoiding instantiation when we're dealing with like, large batch processing. Because it's not just, um, you know, even, if you're, even if you're only iterating them one at a time, that's a lot of stuff to instantiate right away. Um, Traversing relationships can occur additional queries. So here's an example where, um, so basically when I, when I go to follow a foreign key, if I don't have that in memory yet, I've got to go get it from the database. So now I'm making two queries instead of one. If you know you're going to need it, you can use something called select, select related. And this basically says, hey, well, I'm, going to go, I'm going to make this contact query, and it's going to be a related field called address. So when you go and do the get or do the select from the database, uh, get me the address data too. Um, pretty please. So that, that lets you avoid um, the extra query. And finally, um, when it, I said I was going to tell you why you should not chain if you can avoid it. Um, query sets maintain their state in memory as you go. And when you do that chaining, so when you say filter something dot filter something else, you end up cloning your initial query set as a starting point. Query sets are not small objects. Um, they are actually pretty, pretty huge. Um, especially after they've started to uh, load data from the database, they may have a cache, 
And uh, so that all gets to do to memory. So if you can avoid filtering, or if you can avoid chaining filters, do so. You will see uh, better performance. So finally, I just want to talk about falling back to wall SQL. Because your know, Jankowski database is agnostic, but you don't. I mean, presumably, well, let me rephrase that. We were talking earlier about the difference between libraries and um, sites. So things you might want to reuse in many places versus things that you're writing for one site. Um, if, you're writing, if I'm writing eventbrite.com, the chances of us changing from MySQL to PostgreSQL um, are approach, uh, there's a limit approaching zero, and <laughs> it's pretty damn close to zero. So if we need to do something much faster, or we need something that the ORM is not good, uh, we can do that in Wall SQL. Uh, there's a few, but we don't encourage this because it actually is harder to read sometimes, but there's a few different ways Django helps out. One is this raw method. Um, you must retrieve the primary key for the, object, for the class that you're actually querying against. So in this case, I'm getting from the contacts table, I'm going to contact objects, and I'm going to get all the rows out. I don't have the key, but you have to get the primary key back. Um, you can get other fields, though, and they will be loaded from the database when needed. So that might be useful for you. Never, ever, 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 never, ever, ever, use string formatting in the raw method. So what do I mean by this? I've got this percent s here, here percent s um, parameter, um, but I'm not actually interpolating it with, another, with the following percent, right? I'm passing in my parameters as a list afterwards. If you do it this way, Django will escape it for you. Django will protect you against SQL injection. If you interpolate it yourself, you will probably drop all your tables at some point when somebody decides that would be fun. Don't do it. Don't do it. Um, so there's a few other manager operations I want to let you know they're there. There's a get or create, which does exactly what it sounds like. You either get something from the database for you or create one for you. There's an update, which corresponds to SQL update. There's a delete. And finally, there's a bulk insert, which is um, super useful if you're dealing with large amounts of data. Um, finally, uh, how many people here use My, MySQL? Okay, so like half of you. Um, <laughs> if you use InnoDB as MySQL, it breaks Django's Git or Create. So Git or Create is super useful, right? You have a user come in, you want to make them a session object, uh, but you don't want to. You want to do a one shot and figure out whether it, you know, does it exist? Give it to me. If not, create it, right? So this is a very simplified version of what Git or Create does, and uh, I'm going to tell you then why it's broken for MySQL out of the box. Um, first, try to get makes sense, right? Your Git or Create, and um, if it, if it does not exist, so that fails. Now it's going to make a new one, and it's going to try and save it. Um, but we need this integrity error here. And this usually happens if you have a high traffic site and multiple people hit it at the same time. So, uh, hey, maybe in the intervening cycles, somebody else has already created it. So, okay, I got an integrity error. It must be there now, so I'll get it again, right? Um, but <laughs> if it still does not exist, what the hell does that mean, right? Well, the default isolation for NoDB is uh, called read repeatable. And what this means is, when you start a transaction in MySQL with NoDB, uh, it basically snapshots where your database is. Every, and you're guaranteed that in, a, in the life of that transaction, if you do the same read once, twice, three, 42 times, you will always get the same data back. So this is pretty handy when you're doing like financial applications and you're trying to do reporting and you want to make sure you're consistent at the point in time you start your reporting. It's not so helpful in this case where we're dealing with web stuff that users are actually using. Um, so what happens is I go to the get, that's a select, right? Somebody else beats me to it, so I get an integrity error. But my transaction hasn't actually reset yet. So um, I, go, I go to the get again, I'm doing the exact same get, and my SQL's like, oh, I know the answer to that. Here, it doesn't exist. Um, so uh, how do you get around this? Um, the easiest way is to flip your MySQL session or uh, database from read repeatable to read committed, which says always serve me back the most, the most uh, up-to-date <laughs> committed data. Um, that can be really hard if, you, if you're far enough down the road and you have a lot, you know, basically it requires downtime. If you have replication, it's really, it can take a lot of effort. But, this is just something to be aware of because, um, you know, we stared at this beat our head against this for many, many hours before we figured out that Django was actually thought it was doing fine. It was actually the underlying bit. And this is, you know, sort of goes to like, Django is a framework and it's general and that's great, but at some point you have to go beyond the generalizations to actually figure out what's going on. So um, that sort of concludes this like super high level thing of overview of ORM. Uh, well, so, which we did not do, that's right. So we had a, temp so we had a temporary hack. We, well, yeah, we had a temporary hack, which we did uh, around the highest traffic areas um, when we first discovered it, which basically what it did was we overrode or create our default manager. And then um, if you got the integrity error, we added a fake transaction start. So basically, we, we forced a transaction commit for an empty transaction. That's right. Uh, but, so the downside of that is that that increased um, traffic to our database, not insignificantly. But eventually, we had some scheduled downtime coming, and, uh, and we did flip from read uh, repeat people to be committed, and um, it worked. So <laughs> it was harrowing, though. Yeah, I have to talk about afterwards. Basically, the, 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 a, we have a you know, multi master, multi slave setup, and so it takes some thought to get it right, but it can be done. Um, so in the remaining uh, time, 
Uh, I'm talking about forms, and I'm probably not going to get through quite all of this. So you know, it's online. You can look at it there. But um, I do want to. So I find forms actually super useful. I also find them um, people you don't people either don't really think about them or don't use them that much. And so, and there's a lot of stuff under the hood that goes on. So I think it's a pretty important topic. But um, yeah, it's, let's talk about what we can get through. So we talked about this sort of uh, context here, and, yeah, and keep in mind that the whole point of forms, in my opinion, is to take input from the user and turn it into Python objects. So you can actually do some operation on it, whether that's update the model or um, you know, create something new or whatever. Forms look a whole lot like models when you define them, right? They uh, subclass from forms.form. They have a set of fields. Um, they have different types. You, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these parameters are even the same as they are in, database, in the models. They, they don't map quite exactly, but they're um, pretty similar. They also have this optional widget thing here. Um, if you don't provide one. Django will give you the default one. And the widgets are used for HTML output. So, um, so sort of the secondary function of forms is you can render your forms in HTML. I think, I don't know if I'm in the minority or not. I think a lot of people consider that to be their primary function. I consider that to sort of a secondary function. Um, and this is, so basically there's two different states for forms when you instantiate them. You can instantiate them as an unbound object, so something that's just, uh, something that can be rendered. Or you can instantiate them as a bound form, which means they actually have data associated with them, and you can perform validation and actually convert that data into Python objects. So um, there's a data keyword already passed in. That's usually request.post when you're coming from a view. And there's a files. That you can, if, you're, if you're dealing with files load, you can pass those in as well. Um, so Django does a couple things that are kind of nice under the hood. Forms, are, forms use a meta class, just like models do. So um, I end up with uh, form.fields and form square bracket that I can use to access these fields. And these are actually both they, you, know, you would think that this might be um, a, class, a class level attribute or a class level thing that I'm manipulating, but it's actually instance level. So you can manipulate these after you've constructed the form, and other copies of your form won't be impacted. Um, so you've got, but you get, you get two slightly different things back here. You get a field back, in this case. That field is exactly what you defined right here. Um, so it has the properties you would have in care field. If you use a square bracket notation, you get a bound field. And the bound field just maps it, and that provides some HTML output, um, some helpers that, that we'll sh I'll show you in a moment. Forms can have initial data you can pass in. I think this is, makes sense. Uh, this is just a dictionary. And uh, that's, that's going to be used as a starting point for your form. So when we talk about validation, um, this is really the process that gets us from input to Python objects. Um, there's two different steps. There's field validation. This is actual field level. And there's forms. Um, there's this is valid method on every form. Basically, you don't, have to, you don't have to trigger validation yourself almost ever. You can do things like access is valid or errors. And it's going to handle it for you if you need to. There is this full, the full clean method is what performs the full cycle if you need to trigger it yourself, but that's pretty rare. Um, after validation, there's this clean data dictionary that will have all the fields in your form that have been validated, and there'll be Python objects at that point. So field validation has a few different, has three different phases. Um, there's Python conversion, there's validation, there's cleaning. So any of these might raise errors and short circuit the other ones, but um, uh, typically this is how it gets set up. So um, for every field, you're gonna do a field.clean. Field.clean calls to Python. And 2Python is what says, hey, this is supposed to be a number field, so I better make sure that everything in it is a digit. Or um, this is supposed to be a choice field, so I'm going to cast it to bool. You have field validators. These are things that add some additional logic. So for example, um, uh, on the character fields, max and min length are handled as validators. So 2Python makes sure I have a string. Validators make sure my string has the right length. Um, and then finally, there's uh, this clean uh, underscore field name, which is the method you can define on your form to do some custom customized cleaning and validation. Um, right. The important thing here is that these must return value. So here's an example of a contact form that has a name and email. And um, we don't allow hotmail.com addresses in, in my contact manager. So um, <laughs> I have a clean email method I've defined here. And that clean email method, uh, first it gets the email out of clean data. And if it ends with hotmail.com, I raise a validation error. Otherwise, I return it from clean data. I'm going to pass it through. So there's um, like two or three things here to look at. First of all, uh, I'm using .get instead of square bracket access. The reason I'm doing that is because Email is not a required field in this case, so I don't have required equals true in there. So it might not have been passed in. Um, it might not exist in that dictionary. Uh, so only values that were actually passed in and have actually passed through the validation process, or the two Python process, um, are going to be in your claims data dictionary. Um, so I use get and I have a default here. The validation error here, this string inside the validation error, will be available when I render that back to users. Um, so I can show them that. And then finally, I have to have to have to return it. Otherwise, um, I clean what's happened to date will disappear. So the, J the Django form framework just says, hey, give this thing the opportunity to clean it and take whatever it gives you back and put it into the clean data. Um, so there's also a, a generic clean method that can do things like that are across different fields. So you're not guaranteed that fields are going to be validated in a particular order. So this is where you do things like making sure that password one and password two are the same when you're resetting your password, that kind of thing. So here's an example where, um, yeah, here's I have a confirm email form where um, now I've got two different email fields. 
and I can't do this check in either of their clean methods because they might not be done yet. So that I have to do it at the very end. Um, and this here, let's then I do that check. And again, this has to return cleaned data dictionary. So you can see it re just returns self.cleaned data. Um, so initial, your initial data is not your default data. So it kind of is, but it's not. Basically, if your user blanks the field out and then they submit the form, um, it won't call back the initial. Yeah, so it's used to present the user with something, but that's it. Um, I'm kind of aware of the time, so I'm going to skip through some of this here. So tracking changes is actually um, really helpful in forms. Uh, when you want to see if somebody's edited something, this is sort of like the dirty, Django dirty fields I mentioned, but the forms actually have built in. Um, there has changed method you can call that's going to tell you whether this form has changed from its initial values. And there's a changed field, which is actually a list of the things that have changed. And that's super useful, so, um, uh, so you can track these things. If your initial values are not static, though, this can be tricky. Like, what do you actually use for this? So there's this show hidden initial uh, parameter, which when you go render the form will actually give you a hidden field. Um, you can decide for yourself whether it's actually like, a good idea for your form. You know, it, does, it does introduce the opportunity that you, people can muck with things on the front end before they submit it back to you, but it lets you sort of stash that and get easy access to it when they come back. Um, testing, it's a lot like models, but you want to test your validation, test that your clean data has what it wants, that you expect what your initial states are. And remember what forms are for. So uh, I've had cases where I've been trying really hard to write a test for a form, and, um, and it felt like I was working really hard. And I later had the conclusion, oh, if I change this and sort of split things up, find that dividing line and split into two pieces, um, it's going to be a lot easier to write a test. And so that's, I, I've adopted that as a good guidance for uh, figuring out whether my stuff is cohesive and whether I'm actually doing the right amount of work. So um, this is an example of a, of a simple unit test uh, that tests my validation, where um, my contact form had a limit on my name field of something less than 300, I don't know what it was. But here I'm, giving, I'm making the form data. This might come from request.post in a real case. Then I change the form and I call it is valid. And this is going to return false at this point because uh, x times 3, so 300 x's is going to be over the maximum limit. So this is a really simple way you can test that your validation works the way you expect it to. Um, we have a library we, we, we spun out of our code base in open source called Rebar that makes your form stronger. Um, and there's rebar.testing, which has a few helpers. One of them is flattened to dict. This is kind of helpful where you can um, take, give it a form and, um, and it'll give you a dictionary of the data as it exists in its initial state. So then you can, so if you have a very large form, this is much easier than trying to make your test uh, have all the values you need to get to a valid state. Um, so just a, I mentioned this earlier in terms of um, class-based views. But this, so the, the, Django's, um, the Django's default form processing flow looks like this. You, you do a HTTP get, you get a page with a form. You submit it to the post, and if it's valid, you redirect with it. You send a redirect to get the success page. Otherwise, you render it, uh, if it's invalid, you render it with the, uh, um, with the errors in place. So class-based views make this pretty simple to have that whole flow and not have to really do much work. Um, at the very, like, all I really need are these three lines here. And this says, when this view gets hit, Render the contact form, and uh, when it's successful, redirect me contact slash contact slash sent. Otherwise, you know, render with the errors. I can do other things here when I um, call form valid or form invalid. So I can actually send a contact email to in form valid if they've given me all the correct values. But you know, this is you, the, the combination of forms and class based views really classes things. Um, forms having output methods are usually pretty helpful. The, I don't actually use these whole form methods much, but they're there. Basically, they'll give you a table or a, or a list or paragraphs. Um, what I end up using are these fields. So I say, like, full field of form, or, you know, form, square bracket of field. You have label tag, you have errors, you have um, HTTP help text. You have all these different things you can use to control the output and really drive it from one piece of code. Um, you can do classes. Error message, you know, talk about error messages show up. Um, some of these are built-in stock error messages, um, so you can customize them when you need this, come back and look at it. And finally, um, there's this thing called the error class, which maps all of your errors up and controls how they get outputted. So um, by default, it gives you a UL, but you can do all sorts of interesting things with this, like actually turn them into JSON if you're doing an AJAX thing. Uh, here's one that maps them pair as opposed to an, an, order, an order list. It's pretty, um, basically all it has to do is implement a done code method and, um, and go from there. So you see this is an error class and you can start the form. You can put multiple forms on a page with prefix. Um, it's not Really interesting, or it's actually really helpful, but not important how it works. And um, I'm about, so I just want to talk about forms from models really quickly. Um, basically, model forms are specialized instances that let you automatically create a form for models. So if you're letting people edit or create instances of, a, of one of your models, you can use model forms to get to a starting point very, very quickly. And um, in this case, if you keep in mind this philosophy of taking input and turning it into Python objects, in this case, we're taking input and turning it into a Django model instance. Um, so here's an example where I have a contact form and a contact model. So my model 
You see it has three different fields, a name, email, and some notes. In my contact form, all I have to do is define a, the, the, this meta inner class and tell it what the model is. Okay? And it's going to go and look at the fields, introspect them, and generate the corresponding fields. Because remember, we saw they, they, map up pretty, they match up pretty closely. Um, you can say, I only want to do certain fields. That's kind of helpful. Uh, so you can either, ex like I could exclude notes, or I could limit it to name and email. Um, and so that lets you just limit things. And finally, you can um, override particular fields. Uh, so here I'm saying, for example, that my, um, my name should be a text input as opposed, so a text box as opposed to a one-line input. Um, there's one extra bit I want to talk about quick um, that is on the validation side, which is that there's a post clean that gets called. Um, people get confused sometimes because they are using a model form, they've created one for their model and memory, and then they call clean on it, and suddenly this, this object that they had, the model they're using, refers to the new data. And they haven't saved it. How to have, well, post clean called, regardless of whether the form is valid, and what it does is it, said it walks through your list of clean data and applies it to the in-memory instance. So before you even call save, this isn't applied. It's just something to be aware of. Um, I'm aware of time, so I think um, I'm going to skip a bunch of this stuff. There's content here about form sets, model form sets, management forms. There's a, um, I, this is probably, the, this is duplicated content that I, or it's the content I gave at a PyCon talk about this, so I, it's pretty well fleshed out. But um, I encourage you to look at it and email me the questions you have. And at this point, I will simply thank you for sitting through two hours of this and taking the additional questions you have. Thanks.